Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. You probably know our next guest from his years in front of the camera with projects like Almost Famous, The Nick, I'm Dying Up Here, This Is Us. But now Michael Angarano is stepping behind the camera, writing, dire writing and directing the new film, Avenues, a slice of life story that takes place over the course of one night that will change its New York-based characters' lives forever. Let's take a look. I have a feeling about all of us. A feeling? Mm. Really? What kind of feeling? I don't know, just a gut feeling. Would you guys like to accompany us tonight? It's a little bit of an occasion. Yeah, it is. It's his birthday. Well, you and Peter have been friends your whole life? Yeah. yeah. That's very sweet. You guys must really love each other. Yeah, we do. I'm not angry. Are you sure? I'm not angry. I'm not pessimistic. No, 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 no. I'm very, I'm, I'm very realistic. If That's what I am. Step That's back. what I am. I didn't ask you to come to New York. I came here to help you. That's what I've been trying well, to do. Well, you're not helping. And you just you're yell at me and you get defensive. Well, he has stability in his life. In contrast to me. Sounds romantic. It's not. Such a weird choice for him to be a sex therapist. Well, he's a narcissist, so what do you expect? I just found out that you kissed my friend four years ago. No, no, don't speak French to me. Speak English. I probably shouldn't have said anything. I'm going to stop you right Max, there. I'm not freaking out. out. I'm not freaking out. I'm freaking out a little bit. What are we supposed to do here? Jack wanted me to come here. It was in his letter. Yeah, it's a little unsettling that our dead brother's sending me letters in the mail. Yeah, I'm a little upset. It's a little weird. Days like today, meeting you, that's happiness, my friend. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, I've lost you, but if you feel good about it, that's what's important. Everybody, please welcome Michael Angarano and Nicholas Braun. Hey. All right. Hey. Hey, Nick. Hey, Mike. Good hey, to Mike. see you, pal. Nice to see you. Great Thanks to so see you. Thanks so much for being here, guys. Congratulations on this film. I was telling you in the green room, I loved it. I love like a shaggy dog New York story mm. of people walking around and talking and, and, and getting to know each other. The thing is, is that those movies are also incredibly hard to make because yep. when they're not good, they're the worst possible movies that exist <laughs> in the world. Yeah. And uh, fortunately, you made a good one that I really enjoyed watching the characters. You're constantly peeling layers back on the characters and revealing more and more about them that is at times funny and really tragic. So congratulations on that. Thanks, man. Yeah. Appreciate that. It um, was hard to make. Right? Yeah. And I mean, it, it, it was physically it was, yeah. hard. Why? Well, it was, it was very cold. It was, um, we shot it uh, December 15th to January 5th. So over Christmas break. Yeah, basically like when you guys were off from whatever you yeah, were doing? Yeah, it's literally when it, all of us were available. But originally the movie, the script took place in a blizzard. Um, I didn't and, know that. Yeah. I think, well, you read it. <laughs> Did <that>. I? <laughs> no. That it was exterior blizzard. <laughs> but it was one of the things that, yeah, like upon, you know, getting into pre-production, that was one of the first things we had to, we had to go without because apparently fake snow in New York is illegal. Really? Yeah. You're not allowed to shoot fake snow into the street. Or if you do, it's very expensive. The permit for it is very expensive. The elements of that that are going to have to change. I mean, having a blizzard and having them walking around in a blizzard continuity becomes a problem. Right. AD, you have to get significantly more ADR, most likely, oh, yeah. I would imagine, because of wind. Yeah, but this movie in general, you know, there was really little money. I mean, pretty much nothing. I think it was, as far as anything I've ever done, the smallest production size. I mean, it was, you know, a crew of, like, 25, um, no trailers, all, all of us were getting hair and makeup done in, you know, Dunkin' Donuts, the Central Park public restrooms, that's true. Like, all the money was put on screen, so it was not a comfortable movie to make, and we only, you know, we had 15 days. It's a testament to your ability as a first-time director that it looks like you had some money. Like, it has a visual look, and it never looks flat, which is usually what you get with movies that have very little money. Right, thanks. That, that, I appreciate that, because we, we had to make a choice always to shoot the scenes economically. You know, we always had to choose one interesting shot as opposed to five shots in which you're, you're getting medium shot, wide shot, over-the-shoulders coverage. So it was a little bit all or nothing because a lot of these scenes are long because it's so much dialogue, it's character driven, not, not a lot of plot. So there's a, 
Everybody had to, you know, hit their marks, say their lines. Did we, you find that going into shooting those scenes and having such a limited amount of options in terms of how you're going to shoot it helped you focus on what was good about the scene and what drove the scene forward? Because when you have all those options and you can cut around, you can kind of just go in and be like, let's shoot the scene and I'll get in the editing room and I'll, I'll figure it out. But if you only have one or two shots that you can do, you have to be like, this is what is driving this scene. Let's make sure our actors hit it. Yeah, it, it was definitely comprehensive in that what's important here? What are we learning? How is this moving on to the next scene? But also, um, it lent, I think, a, a really good energy to the film because there's a little bit of a theatricality because, you know, you're watching all of the characters interact with each other and it's really the chemistry that we all had. And um, uh, yeah, it actually, I think the fact that we had to be economical and improvise you know, our shot selection, a lot of the time, given the circumstances of wherever we were filming, it actually helped the movie a lot. Well, it also, uh, whether it's intentional or not, references to kind of New York movies like Annie Hall or Manhattan, where he, as much as he could have shot around everything, you look at that, it's mostly one shot per, per scene, if I remember correctly. It's been a while. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think they had a lot more time than we did. Yes. <laughs> But it, it's, it, you can't help but, you know, use uh, Woody Allen movies um, as visual references because they're, they're just works of art, so many of them. They're so, they're so beautiful, but also... Simplistic in a lot yeah, of Yeah, really simplistic, but also, you know, early John Cassavetes movies are huge inspirations for a movie like this. And um, one of my favorite movies of all time, which I uh, had in mind when I was writing this, was Before Sunrise, or the whole trilogy, really. The whole Richard Linklater, Before Sunset, trilogy that was a huge inspiration for me just people walking and talking the film essentially one long conversation and now you guys have known each other for a number of years right yeah we did we did sky high together when we were 15 mm -hmm. i think um 15 yeah yeah so that was my first big movie and and mike and i became friends on that and and then we did Let's go through the through the order of things. The, then, the, after that, then it was after Red Sky State. High. It was a film called Red State. Yeah, that's right, Red State. Which yeah. uh, um, Nicholas told me we were uh, doing together when we were playing tennis one day. Uh huh. Mike um, was already cast, and I was, and it was a little surprise for him at the end of our tennis. He match. goes, "So, uh, could tell him. what are you doing these next like couple months?" And I was like, oh, "I'm doing this movie, Red State. It's a Kevin Smith thing." He goes, "Huh? Me too." <laughs> and I was like, "What do you mean?" He's like. Dude, I'm doing it. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> you too? <laughs> I was so excited. I couldn't hold it in. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then we did the, uh, Stanford Prison? Pris yeah. Stanford Prison? Yeah. Stanford yeah. Prison Experiment. And then, uh, then this. So uh, when it came to this, are you guys sort of as close as the two characters are in the movie of Friends? Or are you kind of like work friends uh, more of? I, I think their relationship in the movie is pretty odd. Um, cause yes. they're kind of both I, uh, talking yeah. at each other yeah. and not with each other for most of the movie. Um, so I'd like to think that Mike and I connect a little bit more often than, than the two of them. Yeah. I, it's, it's, it is funny because, and, and completely coincidental because Nick was actually the very first person who I read the script out loud with mm -hmm. when I first wrote it. I wrote it when I was like 21 and it was probably like in between doing I mean, probably before Red State. Yeah, way before Red State, actually. Mm -hmm. But, like, you know, we were just friends hanging out, and I was like, I wrote this thing. It's weird. Do you want to do you want to read it? And he was like, yeah, man, sure. And so we read it at his house together. And, yeah, he was, like, the first person to give me notes on the movie, weirdly. And, and I never thought that I would be in it. I mean, I... He, I never was, thought was I would make just, it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That was all just us talking about it and you had this dream and you had this script and and yeah. we read all the characters and and then you asked me to do it and that was a complete surprise um so yeah i mean it's been a long t a long process i think yeah like nine years or so before we got this thing actually yeah to with the, the exception of the blizzard oh, how has the script changed since the first time you read it with him um i mean i know the one really significant change um mm -hmm. Because, you know, the, the, the Max's brother, Jack, has, when the movie started, he's passed, he's passed already. He died. And I remember at one point um, in writing the script, he was a main character. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't until, like, you know, pretty, about, a, you know, like six months before we started shooting where I realized, oh, he's, he has to have already died. And, and it's his shadow on, on, 
Max and all of these conversations and all of these characters that is going to sort of amplify the stakes a little bit more. Um, when you have a realization like that for a script that you're writing, how much of that realization is uh, you're thrilled that you figured something out and then also exhausted with yourself that you couldn't figure it out earlier? It, it's, it's relief because for the longest time, and also um, clarity, because I, I wrote it in a way, I wrote it, I think I wrote the original draft in like five days. You know, it was one of those real, like, for lack of a better word, like ejaculation of just like I am just doing this over, it was a Christmas break, I had nothing else to do. I was at my parents' house. I had like just gone through a breakup. I was really not working in my life because it was the writer's strike. Um, so there was like no work happening. And so it was just something I did and, 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 and revisited every, every so often over the next five or six years. Did you think that you would, I mean, as much as you just wrote it as an ejaculation when you were 21, did you ever think that you would direct it or that you would give it to another director when it came time for it to possibly be made? Were you like, I want to direct this? Is that how it Yeah, I, I think my feeling about it was that if it ever got made, it would be a film I would direct. Have you always wanted to direct? Yes. And how, how was the experience overall? Very difficult. A lot harder <laughs> than, uh, than it, I thought it was going to be. Not that, not that I thought it was going to be easy, but there's just so much that you learn on the job, on the go, that you can never anticipate. Just things go wrong constantly. Like, uh, up until, like, today. <laughs> you know, just, like, things <laughs> are always going wrong. You, you know, it's just much more of a job than acting is. Acting, you're in control. It's, it's a, you know, you have to learn your lines and you have to show up and everything else is kind of done for you. You're responsible. You have no idea what the chaos is a lot of the time. No, and, you, and you know, my personality uh, up until this point, it's not catered. It's, it's not, you know, I, I don't, I didn't never really thought of myself as having a very sort of like take charge, um, uh, very organized, you know, type A personality. I was sort of like, oh, whatever happens. I mean, th this one's different, I think, for, for most first time, or I don't, I don't know, maybe not, but, you know, we had to talk to cops, like, all the time. We had to, like, change locations constantly. We shot stuff on the subway without permission. We, I mean, we were just doing stuff on the fly, so I think it's a different experience doing it this way, whereas if, you know, you got a few million bucks, you got people who will talk yeah. to those cops for you. You know? The director carrying the equipment as well as yeah. I, plan I, your shot. Exactly. Yeah. That, that, I mean, that's a good point in that when it's such a small movie, a lot of people wear many different hats. I mean, including Nick. I remember we got shut down on Christmas Eve one day. We got shut down three times making the movie. And one night, one day, it was Christmas Eve, and it was supposed to be a really easy scene. And we realized that we had the wrong permit to shoot in a building, and so we couldn't shoot there. And so we had to fire our location supervisor. And for me, I was like, all right, yeah, uh, sorry. You, you, there's nothing we can do. You got us the wrong permit. Right. See ya. Uh, you know, it was, it was much easier for me, but <laughs> I turn around, and, and Nick is, like, really giving this guy a strict talking to. <laughs> like, a real ball out. Like, really just gesticulating wildly. It, he really acting as a producer of the film and, and like really taking charge in a way where I was... Because he was like, because he was like, I'm sorry. And I'm like, dude, you, you ruined the day. Like, this is Christmas and we're shooting. And he's like, I'm, I'm sorry, man. It, it was a mistake. And I'm like, you have to care more. <laughs> we ha we all care. Thing, you you have to care more than you, you care right care now, more. dude. Like, this right. matters to us. I know it doesn't matter to you. And it was like... The movie only got made well, I think, because it was filled with people that really cared about it. So if you if you didn't, like, sorry, you're going to get a strict talking to. Well, that's the hardest part about making something this small where everybody's wearing these hats, where everyone's wearing all these hats. If there's one or two people who aren't willing to wear several different hats mm -hmm. or are the people who are going to go, sorry, we can't do that, it just drags everything yeah. down yeah. horribly. I mean, for me, the, a real, uh, you know, it was a real learning curve, obviously. So many things. Um, do you want to direct again? Yeah, I would love to. And no, it, 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 that's kind of what's great about it. It's um, every day it's, there were these constant, constant losses and things that went so terribly wrong. 
And so many times, in, within an hour, I would be like, oh, well, the movie's ruined. It's okay, just the movie's ruined. But it's only a movie, like, whatever. And then within the same hour and within the day and within the week, there were so many miracles that happened in which something would happen on camera and I would be like, oh my God, that was like, I think we got it. I think we got the scene and I think we can move on. I, I don't know, I, you know, so many, so many instances within, it, it's just such a roller coaster. It really is. It's an emotional roller coaster because it, it's like your living nightmare and it's like your dream come true. Did it, did it help having Nicholas there, not, not just in the movie, who delivers a great performance, but also there as your friend? I couldn't have done it without him, very literally. I mean, from start to finish, even right now, having him here is so meaningful. It's one of the things I'm most proud of in the movie is um, having Nick and having Ari Grainer and Adelaide Clements and Juno Temple. We had uh, great actors who you know, who really loved the script and who really sacrificed their time and, and what their normal pay is <laughs> to come and do the movie. It's just like, uh, it's not only making something with your friends, but it's making things with people who just want to make. And it was very inspiring on a daily basis. One of the things that I loved about the film is that there's real pain in it. The characters are actually suffering. Your character, Juno's character, your character as well. Um, and I think... Often when, when I see films that are made by working actors and they're cast with their other friends that are actors and it's generally people talking, people are very afraid of diving into having extremely emotional, beautiful scenes with each other. What was it like? Was that a little bit easier for you because you were crafting scenes around people that you knew, that you knew what they would want to play, what they would be attracted to, how to get them to go deeper? Um, well, everybody who was cast, they're all great actors, so there was no, um, there was no, you know, reticence to go to any place. I, I remember we sat down about a week before uh, we made it, and we, we sort of rewrote all of our scenes just to give it more depth and, and, and um, more dimension. And I, I, I think all the characters in the film have their own worlds going on. Yeah. It's, you know, you could tell that everybody... That's exists. a rarity in a movie like this. I have to say, as a person who has to watch all of them, <laughs> yeah. that is a rarity in a movie like this. Yeah, I, I think that's just a tribute to how good all the actors are, but also, you know, the movie, when I wrote it, it was from an uncomfortable place. I, I didn't, even though it was like a, you know, a, you know, I wrote it in, in a quick, short amount of time, it was was not from a comfortable place. It was from a place of like real discomfort, having not, you know, been working and all the all of these different things. So I think it was, I don't know. You could probably answer that better. It was sort of just in the script. It was just infused in it in a way. I think, um, I, I think because because it's kind of based on a true story, mm -hmm. and because you wrote it in a certain part of your life, I think it captures this this kind of moment in your mid twenties where. You sort of think you know it all, but you sort of know nothing. And I think it's just kind of ingrained. And, and what I liked about us sitting down together is like, you know, and, and making it our own is that we could kind of both put in what's actually real, what was actually going on at the time. Um, this kind of confusing, kind of painful, like all this kind of growing pain stuff. My character is in a relationship that's four years in and, and it's that moment where it's like, but maybe it means nothing. You know, and and so I think, um, and you know, the girls could speak for themselves, but they're going through through stuff as well. And um, and I think you wrote something that just feels like a, a very specific time when you're kind of growing out of this uh, adolescent shell. You're dressing like an adult, but you're acting like a kid still. Um, well, also one thing that I related to about that period of time in my life that I remember very clearly is that your character kind of thinks that he's better for better than anything that would require him to grow up. Right. But he, he already thinks he's grown up, but he's not willing to put in the work yeah. to actually do it, which is something that like, I remember at 25, 26, just being like, I'm a writer, but I'm just smoking cigarettes and hanging out all day and getting drunk, right. you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The more I torture like, myself, the deeper I am. Yeah, or like, why don't you go to a writer's workshop? Fuck that. It's yeah. like, and, and <laughs> people are like, is, okay, man, go, go die. Like, right, yeah. <laughs> this is the truth. You're a genius. This, yeah. Is, yeah, yeah. this is the truth. I, um, it wasn't until, I, I read it out loud um, with somebody else for the first time that I realized that it was funny. Mm. You know, because I wrote it from a place that was really personal. And as, you know, by the time we made it, I became a very different person. 
and you know had grown up a lot, and now it's coming out, and I, I, I feel like a very different person as well. But when I wrote it, I didn't think it was funny. Mm -hmm. I didn't real. I, I sort of had the character Max's perspective. I thought, I, you know, everything I was putting in there was was honest and right. So it definitely came from this unaware um, perspective that I had at the time. That by the time I made the movie, thank God it took so long because it might have not have had a sense of humor. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you know, it just I had the perspective of five years later, and 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 you know being an adult and, and, you know, going through life where I was just like, oh, yeah, this guy is probably, thinks he's the most self-aware person, but he's probably the least self-aware person. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's a scene in it, um, this, this, and we kind of reference it, your scene with Juno, mm. with Juno Temple, which is really beautiful, really well-written scene about two people who were together, are now broken up, but they are broke. I believe they're broken up when yeah, it's yeah, they are. and they're still just reliving all of the pain and trauma of their past relationship. Um, you are or were in a relationship with her, correct? Right? What was it like doing that scene with, with Juno? Her? Yes. Yeah, we 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 were dating. Um, we were dating when we made that. Um, and I mean, it was great. It, that that scene in general was sort of like a hypothetical breakup scene that not that I didn't imagine for for us, but that I, you know, that I had wish I had with past relationships. Um, but Juno and I kind of came from a place of real love, like we really cared about each other, and we still do. But um, it was this, yeah, it, it definitely allowed us to, um, to, to, you know, kind of role play a little bit and, yeah. and sort of, um, I, think it, I think it definitely adds to the scene in a lot of ways because there's so much comfort with each other and familiarity. And that was that was a rare day where, you know, so many of these shooting days, we were shooting like six scenes in a day. But that scene, I think it was like a nine page scene or something like that. So we had one day to shoot that. And it was one whole day of Juno and I, which it felt like its own piece. It felt like its own movie. Yeah, it does feel like it's sort of its own play within within the movie. Mm -hmm. And forgive me, and I was in no way trying to like allude that like that was your relationship or anything like that. No, but no, no. Being but... in a relationship and doing a scene like that, I would imagine there are just so many uh, I mean, just as a viewer added layer after layer. Well, and it's also, it was an amazing thing of, you know, that a lot of people come away from watching the film and they, they mention that scene. And I, I think Juno is one of the most amazing actors yeah, uh, that we have and and really she's a, a great great character actor i think all of the actors in it are character actors ari grainer adelaide clemens nick and um you know everybody everybody really lent something to the roles they played in such a you know satisfying full way i think we have time for some time for uh, audience questions who has a question who has someone has a microphone Someone pointed over here. Do you have a microphone? I do. I sure okay. do. Okay. In fact, actually, I was reaching for um, a notepad because I didn't want to forget what I was going to ask. Um, Should, do you want to reach for it again? Do you no, 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 that's cool. Oh, okay. I, it's cool. I can improvise. Um, first of all, thank you both so much for coming out and speaking to your movie. It sounds wonderful. Um, I'm now very eager to see it. Um, uh, I promised myself... I wouldn't be that guy who harkens back to um, another period in an actor's career. Mm. But what happened with the Nick? For real. <laughs> For real. Actually, the truth uh, is that the Nick had a really great life cycle that um, I think it was always intended to be what it was. Um, there was a possibility that it was going to go on, but that iteration of the story was um, what was sort of intended. And it was just, you know, a sort of greater choice by the creators and, and HBO to not, or because HBO and Cinemax, mm -hmm. um, to not take it further. But I don't think there's anybody involved who doesn't think that that version of it, what we did those two seasons, weren't, you know, fulfilling or what we wanted. We all kind of knew going into it that there was a chance it would only be two seasons. Or even one when you sign up to something that, is so creatively freeing yeah. and crazy and yeah. costs so much money. Like I can't imagine going on that set for the first day. I mean, like there's no way they're going to keep doing that. Right. But to, to actually, um, that's not a different, uh, era of my career because I, I made, we made avenues in between seasons one and two of the Nick. Oh, wow. mm -hmm. And, and that it was that long ago that we made this. Yeah. 
yeah. Um, so it was it, when we were editing uh, Avenues, the you know the cast and crew of the Nick were the first people I showed it to. So Steven Soderbergh was the first person to give notes and. What was and, that like? Uh, yeah. I, it was incredible. It was incredible, cr incredibly helpful. I mean, they helped in so many ways. It was having you know like a great film professor at your disposal, and you know the cast, and uh, really all of their notes influenced the movie in a huge way. Uh, one more question. I think we have time for who is it right here. How you doing, Mike? Thank you, sir. How you doing, Nicholas? Congrats on the film. It looks really good. Thanks. My question is: Working with the Nick, I'm a fan of you from the Nick. What takeaways did you get from Steven that helps you create this film? It was, uh, for me, it was instrumental. I, 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 I did have these grandiose visions when we first started. I, I think I even, I mean, even told people this, but I was like, yeah, it's going to be, you know, we're not going to shoot more than 12 hours a day. I, I had this vision that it was just going to be like a Steven Soderbergh said, like we, we'd show up, shoot, eight hours and we would go home and it would be really easy and amazing and professional and cut to us at like, you know, 2 a.m. in the in the morning in like 16 degree weather after like a, you know, a 15 hour day. Nicholas is firing the location supervisor. Yeah, Nick firing the location supervisor. I'm doing all these jobs I didn't sign up for. Yeah. I'm boys with the cops now. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But just being on set watching somebody like Soderbergh uh, direct. I mean, he he's all about le optimization. He he's his own DP. But I think you did. I think we did that. I mean, I think it was like in a way, not the same way. I mean, we spent. I think I think we were pretty like we would get into a place and be, and you'd be like, you know what, this whole thing will work in one shot. Like yeah. literally this scene right here, that's the poster. Like I. Oh yeah, that you was, know that was a one shot totally. scene, and and there were a lot of moments like that where it was like, well, the scene is really you know, the dialogue, the connection, if we can achieve it in one shot. And so I think, there, yeah, there are a lot of moments in the movie that get pulled off, like Soderbergh style. For, no, for sure. And he, because it's, he does something better than anybody I've ever seen, which is scene comprehension. You could read a scene one way and imagine it. It's going to, you know, you're going to have a close-up here on the actor's monologue, and you're going to, maybe there'll be a move in here, there'll be coverage. And then he gets on set and he shoots it, and before you know it, you're done. And you have like a five page scene with 10 characters and it's over. Mm -hmm. And so going into this and especially shooting it in between the Nick, it definitely, um, it, it really sort of allowed, allowed me to, to think like really, what do we need here? What is the bare minimum? And what is the most economical, optimized way we could shoot this scene and still have it be interesting? And so that translated to a lot of, Shots that we would, sh like this scene, I think we did 26 times or something like that. I think this was the 18th take that we ended up using, but. This scene, doesn't it also, is this the scene where they also, the, the women get dropped off and we pan with them as they sort of go around the corner and are yeah. kind of still improvising a little bit yeah, as you're going exactly. around? Yeah. 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 But yeah, it just, it was, it was that, that sort of stick to your guns thing of like, just choose a shot, compose it and block it and then just stay until you get it, you know? With Soderbergh, he'll do like one version of that or two versions and move on. And so that's the 45 minutes that it takes that you're on set shooting a five or six page scene and you're like, I'm done. I, he didn't even shoot my coverage. But with this, it was like we have 15 days. We have to shoot as much footage as possible. There's something about Soderbergh where that he seems to know it takes less to do just as much as someone who would be putting more time in like you as the actor might think I need three more takes and he's like or you could think like I was lazy in that take or I didn't have it and he's like no it's gonna piece together well don't worry get out of here yeah that without saying it yeah. he'll just say cut thanks <laughs> yeah that's right he answers no questions right yeah none <laughs> is yeah that, is that is that a good thing or is that hard it as becomes a good thing it starts as a bad thing it starts as a oh I'm gonna be fired soon mm. And turns into, oh, he hired me because I'm right for the part. And there are so many elements at play here other than my internal monologue and my performance. And so he probably knows more than I do. And so it becomes very freeing. And your approach becomes, oh, I'm going to do what I want. What I usually will do on like the you know, fourth or fifth take where I'm just kind of getting warmed up, you do on the first take. You kind of throw it all out there and you're like, all right, if he got it, if he got it, he got it. Wow. You know, 
You know, Nicholas, I have to ask, uh, you're shooting the second season of Succession right now. I was a huge fan of the first season. But I do think um, Greg has become kind of the iconic character of the show. Just anybody who talks about the show, who sees it for the first time, Greg is somehow the entryway into the humor of the show. What has it like to see that phenomenon sort of take off and Greg be a huge part of that, your character? Well, I think, you know, Greg is the non-billionaire of the billionaires. So he's basically like what most of us are when we're watching the show. It's like, <laughs> that's what that's like, you know? And so I actually get to be inside of it and be in the rooms and have conversations with all these people that are so extremely important. So I think people are, you know, they just, there's you can get in touch with that easier than, than the other characters. Um, <clears throat> but uh, Also, he maybe has the only, like, uh, sense of morals in the whole family. So it's nice to see somebody who like chooses to do the right thing where most of them choose to do the wrong thing constantly. Um, but it's, you know, I love, I love, I love that show. I love the part. Um, I think you have what I, you had the scene that I thought was the funniest scene of television last year, which was you and Matthew McFadden at the bachelor party uh -huh. when he talks about the, the prostitute that he's just hooked up with. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. Uh, you say uh -huh. that's not hot. What was your, like that, that is not hot. I, I've never heard of that. He's yeah. He says, and then I, and then I swallowed my own and I'm like, that's, 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 I've never heard of that. He's like, oh, <laughs> He's like, what was he's like that's a thing. No, it's definitely a thing. I'm like, I don't think it is. What was it? I was not what was sexy. it like when they got when you got that page for for that scene? Because it's such oh, a scene gosh. that's like every time we get page, me and Matthew get uh, anything. Me and Matthew together is like my, is my favorite part of the show. I yeah, think. yeah. We, I mean, yeah. Basically, like we get drafts sometimes on set, and we'll read them together, and we just giggle like little like little kids. We're just do you guys of, like, improvise a lot? We do some. Yeah, we do some. Yeah. We, yeah, they set us up, you know, they set us up with great, a great dynamic and we're both really kind of needy and highly ambitious and like as actors or characters as, as characters. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, yeah I was like, huh. Wow. What an admittance. No one would ever say that out loud. <laughs> no, as people were highly confident. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, uh, really slimy on set. I'm always trying to get what I want. <laughs> yeah. Um, nothing like our characters. Uh, so yeah, so it's it's a really fun, you know, every time we get something, it's like, oh my God, how are we gonna do that and not crack up? Um, and then we do usually break in scenes and screw them up. Um, well guys, uh, I love the film, congratulations. Thanks, and uh, both of you have such wonderful careers. You're both on great shows right now. And uh, this is such a fantastic movie to have the two of you in, congratulations. It uh, is available now, it's called Avenues for people to see. How can they see it? On VOD and, and iTunes and, and, and everything <laughs> wherever you watch your movies on your screen yeah you whatever wherever it's there's there. a television there. you've the got film a screen there yeah everybody give michael and nicholas a huge round of applause thank, thank you, you.